Dear Sir, You will recollect when in August last we explored together the Mammoth Cave a greater distance than had before been performed. I told you my determination at some future day of finding the outlet or the end of that extraordinary cavern. I have done so. And while I write the thought of the important discovery that I have been instrumental in first placing before the inhabitants of the outer world fills me with the most intense and overwhelming reflections to the extent that at times I doubt whether I am not under the influence of an exciting dream instead of the reality of truth clears the noonday sun. You will well remember when we were seated in the grand vestibule of the cave, refreshing ourselves, after our curious research, over Kentucky hoe cake and bacon and a glass of pure Southside Madeira. We drank in ludicrous style with three times three, success to Sims Hole and the Mammoth Cave of Kentucky. Even our sable conductor, the grinning Pompey, joined in the chorus, and the vasty cavern with its hundred labyrinths echoed and re-echoed the sound as if pleased at our disturbance of the solitude which dwelt within its bosom. Little did we either of us think, my friend, that our jest was to be reality, that this cave leading to unknown origins was to terminate after ramifications hundreds of miles in extent in a new country inhabited by human beings advanced in civilization and marking a new era in the progressive discoveries of man. Such, however, is the fact, the theory of John Cleve Sims is now proved to be true. The earth is hollow and inhabited, and the world must now rank him with Columbus and Galileo. Being in Louisville soon after you left, I mentioned to Dr. Rowan of that city my intention of making a thorough exploration of the cave and finding its termination. He expressed himself delighted with the plan and proposed accompanying me whenever I undertook it, together with his friend Professor Simmons. We agreed to keep our proceedings secret and fixed upon the first Monday in November as the day of our meeting at my house to make the arrangements. Accordingly, on that day they both arrived and after consultation we concluded to meet again the succeeding Saturday of the week and proceeded to the cave well furnished with provisions and necessaries for at least a two weeks journey. In the meantime, I made all of the arrangements, got together our necessaries, that is, bacon, dried venison, biscuit, a little peach brandy, and all the etceteras, together with eight able-bodied negroes from my plantation to carry these appendages so useful and necessary to say nothing of our own knapsacks, torches, instruments, etc., on Saturday the 17th of November, we met at the tavern near the cave and proceeded at once to the entrance. Our party consisted of eleven, all told Dr. Rowan, Professor Simmons, myself, and eight negroes of provisions we had a sufficiency for about two weeks. Our water, however, 45 gallons, calculating at a small allowance each, was only a 10 day supply, but of this I felt no fear as I knew that there must exist springs somewhere in the cavern. When we arrived at the cave and surveyed the gloomy entrance now seen for the first time by Professor Simmons, our undertaking did not seem a pleasant one. Even the Negroes in their talk said no like the devil's hole and evidenced great fear at the idea of being pent up in the bowels of the earth for a number of days. We pushed on with determination having lighted our torches only to be extinguished at the narrows. And at length we stood there where daylight had probably not appeared since creation and our voyage of discovery was now fairly commenced. It had been arranged that I should act as the secretary of the expedition and keep a daily journal of the events. The rest of my communication will be a copy of the journal in its rough state, for which you must make allowance. Journal Saturday, November 17, 1838 This day, at 10 o'clock a.m., entered the Mammoth Cave in Edmondson County, Kentucky, for the purpose of exploring it to its extremity. Dr. Rowan and Professor Simmons of Louisville and Montgomery E. Letcher, myself, accompanied by eight Negroes, provisioned for two weeks. This cave had been explored about five miles. It was many years ago used by a company for the manufacture of saltpeter. 
and half past 10 a.m. We entered the cave, bade adieu to the daylight with the toast of success to our undertaking. About 10 minutes past the narrows, a portion of the cave about 7 feet wide, through which the wind rushed terribly, and entered into the grand vestibule. We relighted our torches and we examined the splendid hall. Our torches scarcely allowed us sufficient light to penetrate the dark profound, at least 100 feet above us, where the ceiling was as flat, smooth, and unbroken as if laid on with a trowel, and a scene as gloomy, and yet grand. After about half an hour spent in examining this noble hall, we passed through the grand gallery, leaving uh, the great bat room on the right, and so through to the haunted chambers, passed through the gap, and reached the farthest known length of the cave explored at 2 p.m. This was a small chamber, nearly circular, the floor covered with fragments of limestone and roof covered with bats who, amazed at our entrance, made fight with the torches and rattled about our heads terribly. It was really ludicrous to witness the contortions of the negroes and hear their exclamations as they all fell flat on their faces. Out went our lights and our laughter was turned to anger while their stifled screams of de devil formed a euphonious compound which taken in connection with the darkness around might well put one in mind of the infernal regions. Peace was at length restored. A light was struck and hastily collecting together a heap of half-burnt canes lying around, a fire was speedily kindled that relieved us from further trouble respecting the bat tribe. We sat around the fire while Jim, one of the negroes, broiled some of the dried venison, and a hearty meal was our first one partaken in the Mammoth Cave. Two passages now presented themselves, and we were in doubt which to follow till we thought of the expediency of firing a gun at each entrance, and the one which reverberated the most was to be our choice. The effect was splendid, from one proceeded echo after echo melting away until lost in the distance it seemed a mere whisper. The other was loud, but ended suddenly as if its progress was barred by a solid wall. By compass, the passage chosen led due east, and now we commenced on our journey. The descent was slight but perceptible. A fine, hard earthen bottom for the first mile we penetrated, save here and there a few scattered limestones that in the course of time had fallen from the roof. The height of the passage averaged about 20 feet, but the width varied greatly. Sometimes 6 feet, then it would extend out to nearly 50. Here a rock would jut out in the most fantastic form resembling a wild human figure or perhaps some nondescript monster, while on the other side would be seen castles and cottages, carved out in nature's most gleesome mood. We continued our journey, novelties of this nature amusing us, without meeting any hindrance, save a few fissures of trifling width and depth for about five miles. Suddenly, Professor Simmons, who was in advance, gave a loud exclamation and instantly fell back, knocking over Dr. Rowan, who in turn overthrew the rear until most of us lay sprawling wholly ignorant of the cause. But it was soon perceived one more step and the professor would have precipitated himself into a chasm of unknown depth, followed probably by Dr. Rowan and myself, and thus would have ended the whole adventure in darkness and death, our fate unknown. For I doubt if the Negroes would have had the courage and sense sufficient to find their way back. On examining the chasm, we found it extended across the whole passage. It was a full ten feet wide. In casting down a stone after a lapse of something like twenty seconds, we could hear it fall into the water. In holding our torches down, we discovered projecting from the wall at one end about twenty feet below, a ledge of rocks with a narrow entrance into the wall. Jim consented to be lowered down for the consideration of an extra glass of peach brandy. Accordingly, we fastened a rope to his body and lowered him down together with the torch. When he soon disappeared through the opening in the wall, we waited with some anxiety for his return, and when half an hour had passed away, we felt considerably alarmed. Soon his light was seen flashing through the entrance, and he appeared on the platform with eyes dilated, bearing in his hand some beautiful specimens of crystallized spar. On raising him up, he related that he had followed the passage about a quarter of a mile when it opened into a grotto, larger than the great hall at the entrance, formed of the whitest marble and covered with the richest gems. 
that when his torch flashed upon the walls, they seemed covered with stars. His admiration, expressed in his negro manner, was unbounded. It being now about 6 p.m., we concluded to have our supper, and being somewhat tired, take our rest until four the next morning when we would make a grand examination of this wonderful grotto. Supper was soon concluded with the watch hours divided, our blankets spread, and a large fire kindled from a species of mold that lay in heaps around us, strongly impregnated with saltpeter. We calculated that there were about 30 miles from the entrance. Temperature by thermometer 60 degrees, such was the first day's result. Sunday, November 18th, the second day. Roused at four, made a hearty breakfast, and had the honor to be the first lowered into the entrance of the new cavern, followed by Rowan, Simmons, and Jim. The rock appeared to be of a light granite formation, entirely different from the limestone above. After following the passage for nearly a quarter of a mile, all the while upon a descent, we opened suddenly upon the most splendid light that my eyes have ever beheld. Imagine a circular marble hall of great circumference with an arched ceiling full 200 feet above you, from which extended stalactites and crystal formations of every shape, some resembling vast chandeliers, others decorating walls seemingly festooned with diamonds on which our torches flashed. Myriads of sparkles dazzled the eye with their gleams. We stood in silence, contemplating this wonderful creation of the Almighty, now probably beheld for the first time by man. After recovering from our surprise, we proceeded to examine the wonders of the scene more minutely. There was no passage leading into the hall except by the way which we had entered. Near the center was a slight elevation of crystallized granite pebbles with a rude seat which we named the pulpit. Dr. Rowan proposed, as it was Sunday, that a chapter be read from a pocket Bible which he had with him. He then took his stand at the pulpit and read the first two chapters of Genesis to three as admiring hearers as ever graced the inside of a church built with hands. Deep in the bowels of the earth, we listened to the word of God, catching every sentence that fell, clear and distinct from the lips of the reader. Never before did the history of the creation sound so sublime as in the ears of mortal listeners as at that moment. In a spacious temple made by God himself, far removed from the noise and tumult of life, we could not fail but to realize the sublime conception of the creation when, when the, the earth, earth was, was without, without form and void. void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There was a slight echo, which added rather than injured the effect. But I cannot describe our feelings. To use the expressive words of Professor Simmons, he felt as if he was in the antechamber leading to the presence of his God. We gave it the name The Church Grotto. After an absence of nearly two hours, returned to the upper passage and found our negroes had succeeded in throwing our rope bridge across the chasm, which we safely crossed and pursued on our journey. We noticed that the further we advanced along the passage, it became more damp, which we imagined must proceed from some subterraneous lake or collection of water. I forgot to mention that the, the uh, the thermometer in the cavern was at 62 degrees, while in the upper passage it was 60. During the rest of the day, nothing of importance happened. Our passageway grew rather wider, and we met with no obstruction whatever. We were rather surprised that we had met with no passages leading from the main entrance. At 6 p.m., halted, and we took supper. By means of our lamps, we made a kettle of hot coffee, which was quite refreshing, and we set our watch and prepared for sleep. This day we traveled about 40 miles. The thermometer was at 60. Course by compass was southeast. Monday, November 19th, the third day. Up at four, breakfasted and continued our journey. Some of the party complained of weak eyes, which considering we had seen nothing but lamplight for nearly three days was not surprising. About a mile from our sleeping place, we came to a small chamber from which led two passages, both about the same size, 
from one of them came a faint noise like distant thunder, which we fancied might uh, be wind sweeping through some further outlet, and this inclined us to follow that passage. After advancing for about a half a mile, the sound increased, accompanied by dampness, and we were now certain that the noise proceeded from the fall of a heavy body of water. After advancing some three miles, it increased to the loudest thunder. The dampness nearly extinguished our lights. The sound now became so terrible that we could not hear each other's voices unless we were close together. On turning abruptly, we came upon a platform extending about a hundred feet, which then suddenly broke off into an abyss, down which from the opposite side extending across the whole passage descended a vast sheet of water from a height of more than a hundred feet. How far it fell into the abyss below we could not ascertain. The rock being slippery, we dared not venture into the edge. Above us was a slight spray, which our lights flashed upwards, gave it a, a slight tinge, resembling the faint outlines of a rainbow. The sight was magnificent. The width of the fall was less than a hundred feet, and formed a complete barrier to our further progress in this direction. We were now convinced that the cave must have an outlet in the direction of the other passage in the small chamber, as this vast body of water evidently pursued the same direction. After taking a farewell view of the cataract to which we gave the name Mammoth Falls, we retraced our steps and we arrived at the chamber from which we started about twelve o'clock. I should have written noon had we been outside of the earth. Here we took dinner, and we entered into the new passage, which we found to be much wider than the other. The rock also was of a different formation, being a species of nisus. Our pathway was now more obstructed than at any other time previous. In some places the fragments that had fallen from the roof nearly choked up the passage, so that it cost great labor in clambering over the ruins. The top of the passage was also covered with fissures, and the whole appearance denoted that it had been opened up by an earthquake. We proceeded but slowly on our way, and at six o'clock we had not advanced the distance that we had wished, so we concluded to keep on until about eight. About that hour we discovered a spring of boiling water, directly in our path which issued from a fissure in the rock, bubbling and foaming as if it was in a kettle. It had a pleasant taste and we soon put a portion of it to good use by making a pot of coffee that was truly delicious. We also boiled one of our pieces of bacon, and we lacked nothing but a few vegetables to have made our supper fit for an epicure, made the usual preparations, and prepared for sleep. This day traveled about 28 miles. Average thermometer, 60 degrees. Course, east by southeast. Tuesday, the fourth day. We were roused early this morning by a terrible noise that sounded like thunder. All started up, groping about and shouting to each other, for the lights were extinguished. And indeed, considering the situation we were in, there was no wonder at the display of trepidation manifested on all sides. One of the negroes soon struck a light and we discovered that Jim, whose watch it was, was missing. This alarmed us and we immediately commenced the search. Proceeding a little distance along the passage, we came to a small apartment, and there we discovered Jim extended on the floor with a discharged rifle by his side, and he was perfectly insensible. We had him carried back to our encampment, and after rubbing him some time and pouring a little brandy down his throat, he seemed sufficiently recovered to tell us the cause of the disturbance. While trimming his torch, he stated a big black monster, black as the devil, with wings flew at him, knocked him down, and then he flew back. Catching up a rifle, he run after the nondescript, which kept flying from him, until he thought that he had him within shooting distance. When he fired, and in an instant, a whole legion of devils rushed after him, fluttering their wings in his face, and he recollected nothing more until he found us rubbing him. I instantly suspected that the, a bat, attracted by the light, had flown through the passage and gratified in the belief, as I knew that these animals must have an entrance other than the way by which we came. We took breakfast and then followed the passage leading to the scene of Jim's adventure, to the great fear of the negroes who no doubt expected to meet the devil to a certainty. 
On entering the chamber, we found an enormous bat lying dead that measured over five feet from wing to wing in body and proportion. It was indeed a monster. Jim felt like a hero. The Negroes recovered from their fright and gave him the name of Jim Bat, which he bore during the rest of our journey. We passed on expecting to meet more of the tribe, but they had evidently been as much frightened as Jim himself and taken themselves out of the passage. Pursuing our journey until dinner time, without meeting with anything extraordinary, we stopped to lunch, and on placing my pocket compass on the stone floor, the needle commenced oscillating rapidly. We could not account for this singular variation because on removing the compass a few yards further, it instantly ceased its motion and pointed apparently correct. But whenever placed within a certain space, the oscillation was renewed violently. The rock within this space was kind of porphyritic stone mixed with the granite and a species of ore resembling iron, and the whole had evidently been acted upon by fire as it presented that molten appearance peculiar to metallic substances cooled in a half-dissolved state. After dinner we discovered that one of the tin cans containing oil had leaked several gallons, and on making a calculation of our future consumption found that with great economy we had not more than sufficient to last us five days longer. We held a council and came to the conclusion that if no outlet was discovered by the next day noon, however reluctant we might be to return, we should be compelled to do so. We therefore resolved to make the best use of our time and rest very little at night. Pursued our journey at one o'clock and after traveling a few miles, found that our thermometer had risen two degrees, which cheered us, as we found that this betokened a connection with external atmosphere in the direction that we were journeying. Our path was unobstructed, so that we advanced with more rapidity than at any other of the previous times. The archway above us was filled with numerous fissures, and it seemed as if at some prior period, internal fire had cracked and split openly whole passage. A species of moss also grew on some of the portions of rock, some of it quite fresh. But that which gave us more delight than even the splendid sights that we had already met with was a little solitary flower picked by Dr. Rowan. From where it grew in the cleft of a rock, far removed from the light of day, the sight of man, or as far as we could discover, the haunt of any living thing around. It was a light slate color and resembled a wild rose, though it was destitute of perfume. At a little distance farther on, we met on the side of the passage of a spring of water which crossed our path and was lost in a cleft of the rock. It was very pleasant to the taste and we rested to try its qualities with some of our peach brandy, drinking to the flower that first cheered us on our solitary journey. We were soon again upon our march, and met with nothing particular, except that we passed through numerous chambers, from some of which led small passages. We found plenty of moss in a state of vegetation, giving us renewed hope of soon meeting an outlet. In this way, we continued our route until 3 a.m. when we stopped to rest until 6 o'clock. This day we had journeyed nearly 60 miles, being a much greater distance than any of the previous time, thermometer was at 62, the course due east. We took our coffee and supper, confident the next day at the same hour we should be out of the cave, retired to rest, but my mind was so occupied with the imagination of new scenes and discoveries that I slept but little, and I presume the rest of my companions were similarly situated. Wednesday, the fifth day, all up at six o'clock and after a hearty breakfast commenced our journey. We had not proceeded more than ten miles before we came to a spacious hall in one of the parts where we found numerous bones of some enormous animal, together with tusks resembling those of the mammoth in the museum at Philadelphia. After an investigation of the probable size of the monster to which they belonged, Professor Simmons stated that it must have stood at least twice the height of the largest elephant. The bones were very numerous, and from the height of the entrance, the animals, when living, never could have entered in. It was evident, therefore, that they had been placed there by the hands of man. Continuing on, 
We found along the passage scattered bones of smaller sizes, and in some places they were regularly piled up. Not a great distance further, one of the negroes struck something with his foot which sounded like metal, and on picking it up, we found it to be the iron head of a spear, very much corroded and shaped like those of ancient Romans. We needed no further proof to show that the end of our journey was near. We also found pieces of wood fashioned by some instrument showing the handwork of man, and at length a faint glimmering of light was seen in the distance. We hastened rapidly onward, and on turning a sharp angle, we entered a vast hall opening directly to the light of day. Oh, what a shout of burst from all of us. From that moment onward, we rushed. The goal was won. Our eyesight at first dazzled, after our long absence from day, gradually returned and we stood looking down upon a vast plain that lay a mile or two below us covered in green, beautiful pastures and trees. The fields spread with rich flowers and in the distance a range of high mountains extending up into the clouds. But the sky, such a light, so beautiful, so clear, and all of the tints of the rainbow. To the north appeared one glow of living light, dazzled to behold, gilding the whole scene with surpassing richness until it faded away into the extreme south. Indeed, the whole view partook more of the fairy scenes described in the Arabian Nights than reality. We were in the interior of the earth, and Sim's theory of an opening in both poles was now fully proved. Indeed, the general appearance of the atmosphere was so different from that of the world that we had left that a glance showed the correctness of Sim's theory. The light appeared to enter wholly from the north, for to the south, as I before stated, it gradually melted into indistinctness. As the sun outside of the earth was now in its winter solstice, of course it was advancing northerly, which accounted for the light coming wholly from that direction. This made the day perpetual until the sun nearly reached the equinoctial line when the light grew less until it passed far south, where it would shed its light through the southern orifice. That portion of the new world would then receive its day while the northern portion would be comparatively dark. We returned back into the cavern to divest ourselves of those articles which we should not immediately need, previous to our adventuring down into the plains. Here, new wonders struck us. In the corner of the cavern stood sculptured out of a single piece of rock, a gigantic human figure, coarsely executed but showing correct knowledge of proportion. The head was covered with a high conical cap, from which the hair flowed down over the breast, nearly encircling the arms which were crossed, and the head was resting on the shoulders. The lower part of the figure was covered with a species of mantle. The position of the drapery was well carved, showing the outlines of the legs and the whole in a sitting posture. The features we regarded the most, the face was broad and the cheekbones high, the nose also broad with a peculiar flatness across the mouth and the chin, so striking in the physiognomy of the Tartars. The walls around were also carved with rude sculpture and relief of various figures and shapes, one of which struck us as relating to the astronomy of the natives. It was a circle, evidently intended to represent the sun from which the rays were streaming down upon a long oval-shaped globe nearly in a direct line below it. Across the globe were drawn three lines, dividing it into as many equal sections. There was a rude hieroglyphic inscription beneath of some length. There were also figures of several unknown animals, of which much resembled a horse but a horn growing directly from the forehead. About 4 p.m. after a survey of an hour or more, we prepared for our journey into the new regions, taking with us but a few necessary articles, together with our rifles to defend us both from natives and animals if necessary. A rude path was 
wound gradually from the entrance of the cavern to the plains below. The sides of the mountains which we were descending were covered with lofty trees of various kinds and beauty, one of which a species of pine grew to an enormous height. Birds of splendid plumage darted about us. The groves were filled with melodies, and almost every instant animals of various kinds crossed our path, though none of a species larger than an ordinary fox, of which some kind appeared to be. The atmosphere was balmy and gentle, and the wind swept by was filled with the most delicious scent imaginable. It seemed a perfect paradise. At about a mile from the cave we came to a little cascade that came tumbling down from the cliffs and disappeared into a small basin fringed with flowers and water lilies. The water was clear and transparent. Beautiful fish were swimming about, turning in their golden sides upwards as they glided to and fro, and two or three wild swans, distributed by our approach, rose from the lake, uttering their shrill notes as they winged their way upwards and were soon lost in the distance. We paused for a little bit to contemplate the scene. We were still a mile from the level fields which lay stretched out like a many-colored carpet below us, and here would be seen a belt of vivid green, and there some orange, and then perhaps adjoining a field of white and gold, like waving yellow grain mixed with many flowers. Herds of animals were calmingly grazing, and ever and anon flocks of birds rose up to add stirring life to the quiet beauty of the picture. With our pocket glasses, we scoured the horizon to see if we could discover aught of man or his habitation, but we perceived nothing that betokened the near existence of any of our race. We pursued our journey, and presently came to a grove of trees bearing a fruit in appearance like our choicest peaches. They were delicious to the taste, and instead of a pit, they contained a few small seeds. Plum trees also growing around with a fruit exactly like our green gauges, and for a few minutes we resembled a parcel of cormorants gorging themselves after a long feast. Our delicious repast over, we journeyed on, and we soon reached the bottom of the mountain, and on gazing back could see far above us the entrance to the cavern looking like a dark speck in the green verdure that surrounded it. Far above, the mountains towered in grand magnificence until their summits were lost in the prismatic sky. We now came to a wide beaten track, evidently made by animals on their way to and from the hills. The soil was of a rich loamy kind, beaten perfectly hard, and the path would have been considered an admirable road in many countries. It diverged in several directions across the plains, and we selected the most prominent one which lay in a northerly direction. Our way was lined with the most luxuriant pasture, bearing grasses and herbage of various kinds intermixed with flowers of every color and species forming the most delightful prospect imaginable. Now and then a clump of trees would be seen, rearing themselves above the plains perfectly free from underbrush and forming a most beautiful grove. We passed a herd of wild buffaloes, who on our near approach started off at full speed and were soon out of sight. Their appearance, and indeed the whole scene, reminded us of one of our rich western prairies. Having traveled some four hours by our watches, we began to feel hungry and thought it best to kill some of the game which was plentiful around us. We went off a little distance into the prairies and scattered ourselves so as to surround a flock of one or two hundred animals resembling the smaller species of deer. They permitted us to approach within rifle distance when one of our party firing before the signal, they started off with the rapidity of lightning so that we were obliged to fire mostly at random. Fortunately, one was so severely wounded that we captured and dispatched it after a short pursuit. It was one of the antelope species, the head short with curved horns, a slender neck, and the body bulky, the legs slender and beautifully formed for speed. The back of the skin was brown, tinged by a dark streak along the sides, and the belly and the hair was perfectly white. It was a male, very fat, and soon had a portion of his body both in steaks and roasting pieces cooking in a rustic style over a fire kindled by the roadside. The meat was juicy 
and delicious, and never was a meal enjoyed with greater satisfaction than this, the first of which we had partaken in the new region. Feeling somewhat tired after our meal, nothing but the bones of the animal were left, we prepared for a brief sleep. As the day was perpetual, our watches were of no use to take note of the time except to preserve the consecutive hours to be divided at our leisure into the days of the old world. I had just fallen into a drowsy slumber, halfway between sleeping and waking, one of the most delightful feelings of conscious unconsciousness, if the expression may be used, when I was aroused by the loud shouts of the negroes and sprang at once from my couch. They were gazing and pointing with delight upwards, and when my eyes followed in the same direction, I was not less astonished and delighted than they were. In the heavens to the north was to be seen rapidly approaching us some twenty or thirty birds of the most enormous size, and on the backs of each appeared to be seated a human being. We could hear the wild screams of the monsters intermingled with the sound of human voices so clear and calm was the atmosphere. They came rapidly onwards, and in a few moments they were so near that we could perceive the outlines of the human figures perched upon the backs of these feathered giants. Their riders did not appear to perceive us until we raised a shout, and then they suddenly clustered in the air and appeared to hold a brief consultation together. Suddenly they wheeled directly over our heads and descended with a fearful rapidity a little distance from us. Off we started to form an acquaintance with our new visitors, but when we approached within a certain distance, they pulled their feathered coursers by a sort of bridle, and they instantly rose above us, keeping just clear out of our reach. Had we felt disposed or thought it politic, we could easily, with our rifles, have dispatched one of the feathered bipeds and so have secured the rider. We made every signal of friendship, but they appeared suspicious, so we went back to our luggage, thinking it likely if we took no notice of them, they would be more apt to approach us. We skated ourselves leisurely, commenced smoking our cigars, chatted a little, and busied ourselves in various ways, apparently not paying the least attention to our suspicious neighbors. This had the desired effect. After a little chattering, several of them dismounted and came very near to us so that we had a good examination of their persons. They were small in stature, the tallest among them not exceeding five feet seven. Their clear skin as fair as the widest of our own country. Their hair light and falling to the waist, eyes blue and no beard, with a cast of features resembling the face of the statue in the cave, though not so heavy. Going up to one of them, less timid than the rest, I held out my right hand toward him, extending in my left at the same time a biscuit. Within two or three feet of me, he bent his head slightly and crossed his arms, placing his hands upon his shoulders. Judging this to be their mode of salutation, I went through the same proceedings, which seemed to please the stranger, for he took the biscuit which I offered, and after looking at it, bit off a small piece and handed the remainder to his fellows, exclaiming at the same time, Lou, Lou, which was repeated by the others. Intercourse now being commenced, their shyness was thrown aside and they all dismounted, leaving their flying coursers in charge of one of their number and were soon as familiar as could be expected. They were full of good nature and curiosity, perfectly friendly and harmless, and at the occasional remarks of one of their number who appeared to be of great wit among them, they would burst into loud fits of laughter. But the negroes attached their greatest notice. They would examine them attentively, rub their skins hard as if they expected to find the black color of their faces was merely a species of paint. The negroes bore it with perfect good humor and would join in the laugh as heartily as their examiners. In fact, it seemed a race between them which should outdo the other in joviality. Nothing was omitted in their scrutiny. Our clothes, baggage, rifles, all was examined. Dr. Rowan they seemed to regard as the chief man among us, and to him they were very differential in their conduct. Indeed, it was not surprising being tall and well-proportioned, standing six foot two, they regarded him as being of no ordinary consideration. After having satisfied their curiosity as to ourselves, they, by their motions, endeavored to ascertain where we came from, and how pointing south, as if from that direction, into the sky, like they themselves were transported on the backs of birds. 
We pointed up to the hills and described as near as we could the cavern, at the same time by our motions describing our country as different from theirs. Professor Simmons with a pointed stick sketched on the ground a hill uh, with a small circle in the center and described our course from the hill. They seemed to comprehend our meaning with evident delight pointing towards the cave exclaiming at the same time, Hair me tear, hair me tear. I should have mentioned before that the tones of their voices were peculiarly soft and musical, which together with their frank open manners made them pleasant and agreeable companions. At length they made motions for us to accompany them on their ostriches, for we gave their coursers that title. On proceeding to their halting place, we found these enormous creatures feasting on the carcass of a buffalo that they themselves had pursued and killed. They were under perfect subjection, and at a word from their masters left their meal and came towards us, bending themselves as much as possible as if expecting us to mount. They resembled as near we could imagine the ostrich and twice the size of that of Africa. A large pouch formed of hide fastened by a wide belt around the neck and strapped loosely round the base of the wings so as not to impede their flight formed the saddle. A thong of hide fastened at the head of the bill constituted the bridle and in this simple manner were these feathered creatures rendered subservient to man. Our guests motioned us to mount at the same time pointing in the direction from whence they came but we declined, particularly as it was not very pleasant riding two on horseback setting aside a double flight on the back of an ostrich. They seemed to comprehend our reasons for declining and presently two of their number mounted and flew off with great rapidity and were soon out of sight. After an absence of near two hours we saw them like specks on the horizon returning as they approached. We discovered they were accompanied by eight or ten others together with nearly twenty omoms, as they called their coursers, without riders. They soon reached us, and now underwent an examination from the newcomers. Instead of the loose-fitting coarse linen gown, reaching to the knees worn by the others, they were clad in a tight-fitting jacket of undressed deer skin stood with a profusion of glittering ornaments. Beneath this, from the waist nearly to the knees, fell a shirt of blue cloth and thick folds. The knees were bare. Boots of rough dressed hide and a cap formed of materials like the jacket completed the dress. They were armed with iron-headed spears about eight feet long and each had stuck in their belts a small curved knife similar to the Turkish scimitar. Their commander was the tallest man among them being about five feet eight. He appeared to be a person of great importance to his followers, though to us he was very civil and deferential. We were soon informed by signs that the spare omoms were for our accommodation, and after a brief consultation among ourselves, we concluded it best to follow the adventure. Dr. Rowan was the first to mount his omo, which he did by getting into the hide pouch or case on its back, leaving him exposed only from the waist upward like an Indian's papoose, with his arms at liberty to support himself by the throngs round the bone of the wings. We all soon followed his example, our baggage was safely secured, and on the signal being given from our military leader, up we rose. My first emotions were pleasant, yet terrible. I dared not turn my eyes downward, for the sight, however magnificent, would be overpowering. By degrees, I felt that I might bring myself to overcome my emotions and contemplate the glorious scene below. Up we went, soaring higher and higher into the rainbow sky until having reached the desired elevation, our omos formed themselves into regular lines. So well trained were they, and flew as near as possible on a direct level towards the north. I now ventured to take my eyes from the heavens and look around. My companions were all about me, for it appears we were placed in the center surrounded by the natives, whether to prevent us from escaping or for fear that our omos might make away with their new riders I could not tell. By degrees I casted my eyes downward, and oh the splendor of the sight that met my gaze. Far below me like a delicate traced map lay fields, meadows, and hills in their clear primitive colors, mingled yet distinct, and the beautiful atmosphere shedding its variegated light over the whole formed a scene which can be imagined, not described. 
Here run a stream liquid and distinct as a river of molten gold meandering in the distance. The effect of a different light sheeted it with silver, and then, perhaps in the extreme range of the eye, it lost itself in a ribbon of delicate blue. The fields were dotted with animals roaming from spot to spot. Flights of birds far beneath us sent up their sweet strains, mingling deliciously with the noble grandeur of the sight, until the senses were blended so harmoniously together one could imagine himself only in the paradise of the final hereafter. Such were my feelings. My thoughts were lost in the contemplation. At length, the habitations of man began to show themselves. As we approached nearer and nearer the earth, dwellings of different shapes began to multiply. In some places, tall spires and others, humble huts clustering together, showed where man congregated with his fellow man. Now and then, a group of the inhabitants could be seen gazing up at us as we passed along, with apparent unconcern, or perhaps a solitary pedestrian would look at us for an instant and then pursue his journey without further notice. We had by this time been nearly an hour on our journey, and I thought from the frequent consultation between one of the riders who seemed to be a kind of adjutant and the commander that we must be near the end of our flight. Nor was I wrong in my supposition. In a short time, the dwellings became more compact and we began to descend and soon after alighted in the square of a village containing some five or six hundred houses. A crowd of several hundred persons of both sexes and all ages greeted our arrival, regarding us with the utmost astonishment. We were conducted to the dwelling of the officer who headed us, a fine building of whitish stone several stories high. We entered through a door of ordinary dimensions into an apartment which covered the whole ground. The sides and ceilings were formed of boards painted with a variety of colors. Chairs of rude construction were arranged along the sides, and in the center was a wide table covered with provisions just placed there. Signals were made for us to fall to when all left the room, with the exception of our leader and several inferiors who acted as servants. There was flesh of various kinds, boiled, roasted, and stewed, each served in a bowl formed out of the most transparent porcelain, which were handed round in succession to all of us. Before every man was placed a small bowl, into which he placed a little of the several kinds handed to him, and then, mixing the whole together, at it they went. A kind of spoon formed of platina was all the implement used in eating, except the curved knife before mentioned, which was drawn from the belt and served to carve with when necessary. The meat was cooked to rags, but with our appetites we had no fault to find with our food. A signal was given and the attendants removed the bowls and placed upon the table large quantities of the most delicious fruits and melons imaginable. After we had feasted ourselves sufficiently, they were also taken away and three or four long-necked pitchers of solid gold were introduced and passed around containing a fermented liquor resembling beer, but a sweeter taste and weaker. Our repast being concluded, we were informed by signals that this was to be our stopping place and the rooms above our resting apartments. The upper stories were reached by ladders through an opening in each floor, where we found some twenty or thirty thick mats stuffed with a soft substance and covered with most beautifully embroidered silken cloth. After an examination of our quarters, we sallied out, accompanied by a guide, leaving the Negroes to follow their own inclinations. The streets of the pretty little town crossed each other at right angles, being laid out in regular squares. The houses were mostly of two stories formed of stone. The windows were covered merely with transparent cloth, rolled up at pleasure, nor did we observe anything like glass during our stay. The inhabitants were very civil and orderly, never accommodating us in the least. To gratify their curiosity, however, much they were astonished by our appearance. We went into several shops where we found men encouraged at work. Some as tailors, who by the by plied their needles, formed of gold similar to our own, with great dexterity and neatness. The cutlers completed their work to great perfection. Indeed, the steel blades of several kinds of knives which we examined were superior to anything of the kind that we ever saw. We also visited the shops of the various mechanical branches, the manufacture of which would have done honor to any country on the globe. Why I am so particular in my description is that Tantu, 
this town, we afterwards ascertained was one of the principal places in the nation for some kinds of manufacturers, particularly cutlery. We met many females in our progress, most of whom were very pretty with red cheeks, fine teeth, and smiling faces. Indeed, the characteristic trait of these people appeared to be merriment. On our return to our quarters, we found the Negroes gratifying a large concourse of spectators and dancing juba from the shouts of the auditory, we thought that they were highly amused. When we arrived at our lodgings, we found the commandant anxiously awaiting for us, and from his signals wishing us to follow him, which we did. On a plain just out of town, we found, drawn up in military array, about 500 men on foot, some armed with spears and others with steel bows ready to go through their evolutions. At the word of command, they separated into two opposing battalions and went through a sham fight in excellent style. After this, a target was set up, and the bowmen were very expert, hitting the center almost every time at a distance of 50 yards. Dr. Rowan, one of the most expert rifle shots in Kentucky, now thought that he should show them a trial of his skill with his favorite weapon. Observing a large bird floating lazily at a good distance overhead, he called their attention to the object, and raising his rifle with steady aim, pulled the trigger and their astonishment was unbounded at seeing the flash and hearing the report, followed by the fall of a large eagle in the agonies of death. They thronged round him with anxious delight, regarding him as a supreme being, and examined the rifle with the most prying curiosity. We were soon after conducted to our quarters, and after a meal similar to our last, we retired to rest, fatigued and delighted with our late adventure. After a refreshing slumber of six or eight hours, we were aroused by a sound of wild music, something like the discordant notes of a bagpipe immediately in front of our residence. On raising the transparent screen or window, we observed the procession of two or three hundred persons in file, five or six breasts, slowly passing along with a degree of solemnity fitted to some mournful occasion. The leaders were very old men, some of them tottering along, scarcely able to walk and supported by their aged companions who might not be so feeble. Next followed others not so old, and so the ages continued to the end of the procession in regular succession, ending with boys of not more than six years of age. We conjectured that it had something to do with the obsequies of the dead and concluded to follow the procession and witness its termination. Accordingly, we sallied out and quietly followed the train at some distance behind. The music, though discordant, was wild and solitary. It seemed a sort of plaintive wall accompanied by a rude chant from the younger parties of the mourners. Rude as it was, it sounded very impressive. At length, the procession stopped in front of a house, the doorway of which was covered with white cloth and some of the windows hung festoons of a similar material. From the roof was suspended a rude drawing of a green silk that came down nearly to the first story. It represented a tree destitute of leaves, the branches shattered, and the trunk old and bare. It was uprooted and appeared as if it was just falling. A number of small trees were springing up around, seemingly sprouts from the old trunk. Not a being appeared from or about the house, and all bore a solitary appearance. At length, a very old man stepped from the procession and commenced a tremulous harangue, which was listened to with great attention. At the conclusion of his discourse, which lasted perhaps ten minutes, there was a burst of music when the door suddenly opened and four men appeared carrying a bier on which lay a body covered with a white mantle. All this time, the mournful music was sending forth its notes, and the bearers of the body passed slowly on, taking their station at the head of the procession, which now resumed on its way. We noticed that whenever it encountered a passerby, the individual, if a male, uncovered himself until the corpse passed. The females bent their bodies and remained silent with their eyes cast on the ground. Indeed, to us... There was such a general and true expression of grief that we felt a warm yearning to a people who could thus beautifully tender the last tribute of affection towards one of their number now gone forever. After passing through the main street of the village, the procession went out into the fields through a path, 
the borders to which were decked with flowers and fruit trees, forming a beautiful arbor nearly a mile in length, when it opened upon an extensive space of ground, perfectly leveled and graveled. In the center of the plot was erected a pile of light wood, about six feet high, and perfectly square. On the top was laid a couch of some soft substance prepared for the body, which was taken by the bearers from the bier and placed on its position in the center of the pile, covered as before with the white cloth. A chant was now commenced by the assembly, when some eight or ten of the number advanced and threw on a corpse bunches of flowers until it was nearly covered with them. Then others advanced with bundles of odiferous woods and spices, which were placed upon the pile and the body completely hid from view. The old man that I have before spoken of now came forward and bending towards the north made a slight reverence and then turning towards the corpse appeared as if communing with the dead. Slowly rising from his bent posture the aged man motioned to one of the youngest children who came forward and handed the patriarch a lighted torch which his trembling hands applied to the pile and in an instant the funeral pyre was blazing towards heaven. The scene was a philosophic picture of the close of life, and the various stranger could not fail to draw a lesson from the conclusion. The deceased was a venerable man, and a brother in years, performed the last sad office to his remains. Beside him stood a boy, in youth's green spring, the early bud just opening into blossom, as the dead had once been showing that the spring of autumn preceded the last winter of existence, which now had finally terminated. I forgot that I was in a different country from my own, for in the grave all distinction of country ceases, and I thought only of the dead as a brother. Involuntarily these beautiful lines in the Thanatopsis of Bryant rose in my imagination. So live, that when thy summons comes to join the innumerable caravan that leads to that mysterious realm, where each shall take his chamber in the silent halls of death, Thou goest, not like the quarry slave at night, scourged to thy dungeon, but sustained and soothed by an unfaltering trust, approach thy grave, like one who wraps the drapery of his couch around him and lies down to pleasant dreams. We did not stop to see the conclusion of the ceremony, or what was done with the ashes of the dead. They were, however, undoubtedly collected and deposited into the earth. Taking a different path, which led out from the place of the funeral, we found ourselves on the borders of a lake which extended to a great distance. The waters were very transparent, and at the depth of fifty feet we could see the fish swimming along the bottom very distinctly. Sauntering along the margin we came to a group of some dozen men, fishermen, who were preparing to take their prey. We watched them with a great deal of curiosity as we observed no nets, no fishing lines, and were anxious to discover by what method they caught their supply of fish. They received us with great kindness, occasionally scrutinizing us with attention, for the news of our arrival had spread all over the country, but with no ill-mannered or ill-timed curiosity. At length one of the number went up to a hut a little distance off, and brought out several animals resembling our otters, but considerably larger. They appeared to be very tame, fondling around their masters with all the playfulness of dogs, and eager for their duty. They were now taken along the bank, and spread at equal distance apart, when one of the fishermen clapped his hands and gave a shrill whistle as a signal. Instantly they were let loose and dashed into the water where they quickly disappeared. Scarcely a minute had elapsed before one of the otters appeared, bearing a fish in his mouth, weighing, I thought, fifteen pounds. Depositing his burden upon the bank, he rushed again into the water. He was successively followed by the others, and in this manner, in the space of half an hour, they had caught more than a hundred fish of different kinds, the smallest of which must have weighed at least ten pounds. The fishermen now recalled their industrious and useful domestics, and graciously permitted them to regale on such a fish as they saw fit to bestow upon them. The fish were mostly of the pike species, though there were some salmon trout and one kind of eel that had as many colors as a dolphin. While viewing this new method of fish taking, some of our guards came running and shouting towards us, and when we were discovered, evidenced great delight. From their manner, we supposed they were fearful that we might meet with some accident. We accompanied them back to town without meeting anything further worthy of note.
I will not enumerate our actions for the succeeding 48 hours. They were varied and curious, as you may imagine, but our visit to the great city of Kuku, the residence of the king and the mighty wonders seen there, must be reserved for a future letter, which I shall transmit to you in a few days. In the meantime, I remain, dear sir, your most obedient servant, Montgomery E. Letcher. Just as this letter was ready to be put into press, the publisher received the second letter from the gentleman to whom it was addressed, and it will be immediately published. Its contents are highly interesting and extraordinary. Come.